All right, so hello everybody. I am Gwen LaFleur and I am here live at Artistic Artifacts in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm excited to be able to come and be in person at my local store. And we are going to do a little demo today on stitching with stamps. Um, so if you know me, you may know that I, or if you don't know me, you probably won't know, but I have a line of rubber stamps with uh, Paper Artsy. They're a company that's based in France and I've designed 15 sets now for them with more coming out. And what I want to show today is how you can use stamps as part of textile arts by using them as patterns for embroidery. And today I'm going to do beaded embroidery. So this is the sample that I am going to walk you through and I'll put that down so you can see it better. And that is using this set of, of stamps that are my frame stamps. And I just thought it would be fun to show how these frames can become so much more versatile. But you can see I've got some other samples that I've done using some of my other stamps. These are all from my latest release. I've got these fish with these little doodads on them and then I've got some flowers and things and just showing how you can turn these into fun little embroidered pieces. And I'll talk more about some of the things that you can do with those later on. But I wanted to just walk through how I made this piece. Um, and I am not any kind of an expert embroiderer or anything. I'm studying it, I'm learning. Um, and so it's kind of a, if I can do this, anybody can figure it out sort of situation. So I've started, I wanna start, well first, I'm gonna start by getting my gloves on because I, um, I've gotten to where I always embroider and sew with, um, with gloves just to kind of try and help with carpal tunnel and, and arthritis, especially for hand stitching. So these are handy things if you didn't know that they were available. But I want to start, the fabric that I am using is a, a hand dyed fabric and I think that this is a linen and it's just a beautiful piece that has come from these inspiration packs that the store puts together. They're all hand dyed um, by Judy and then your niece does them with you. and just gorgeous, gorgeous colorways. And I love them because they have these beautiful vintage fabrics in them that are fantastic for embroidery. And these pieces here are all done with different inspiration packs. And then the ones here are actually with this new, and I'll show just so you can see what it is. They are these hand dyed linens from India that are dyed specifically for the store. Just so that you can see how it works, I've embroidered on some of the lightweight versions. But, um, so that's what I'm using as the base. The other thing that I really love to embroider on as a base, they're a little bit more expensive, but they're still just so gorgeous are these painter threads. Um, I'm not a purple person, but I saw this color and I thought this is coming home with me. So I've set it aside <laughs> for later. But that is what I'm starting with. And I've already cut myself a piece. And I'm gonna put down just a little base here on the table so I can stamp on it. And I've got my rubber stamp, and I've already just mounted it. These are unmounted with the cling mount, so you put them on an acrylic block. And I am using this archival ink from Ranger. Because I'm just putting this on as a pattern and I don't need it to be washable, this works fine. I know that there are inks out there specifically for fabric, but um, this one is a permanent ink and it will hold up great. And I hope that this will impress pretty well considering the surface I'm on here. That worked okay. It'll be good enough for what we're gonna do today. But um, it gives you a, a good enough print and it'll hold and it'll dry quickly so that you can see what you're stitching on. But this becomes the pattern that I'm going to use for my embroidery. So we're gonna go from that to this, but I am not going to make you watch the entire process, but I'm gonna demo just little bits and pieces of it and then I've got some step out pieces so that we can go through and then you can see as we go through the different steps how it evolves. But I wanted to show just some of the basics of, of some of the stitches I use and what the process is for how I do that. So we will go ahead and get started. I've already got some needles threaded here and um, I'm using embroidery needles for this. And the thread that I'm using, this is the uh, Wonderful Eleganza. This is the size eight pearl thread from the Sue Spargo collection. Uh, I love these variegated threads, but they're also, I use these pearl cottons all the time. It's a beautiful Egyptian cotton. And they have tons of these. 
And I like to use the variegated, but I also like to make sure that I have some solids. They're really good for putting down your foundation stitches and then for adding some surface stitches at the end. I love the variegated threads though. That's what I've used to do the leaves and the flowers and to do some satin stitching on the border. And I just like how easy it is to get this variety of color without having to change the thread. And so that's kind of a little hack. If you're not doing something like a, a needle painting with silk thread or something where you really want to be specific about your colors, then I find that that works really well. So I start by doing some foundational stitches. So I will, I'm gonna actually leave that there just in case. I will usually outline. So in this case, I want to make kind of a, um, a border of this frame. So I just start, and if you're doing something really, really fancy, you would do your, um, your setting stitches. I've just knotted the back of it. But I, you can do for this, you can do a back stitch. I like to do a split stitch. And what you do is you take your stitch and then you come up in the middle of the stitch before and then you go down and you keep on doing that and I like this stitch because I feel like it uses a little less thread than a back stitch and I also like not that it matters so much when I'm going to cover it up but I like that you don't really see the holes where the needle has come in and out of the fabric and so for me that makes this a nice way to do the outline. And so what I would do is I would outline the entire thing on the inside and the outside of the frame and then leave the middle open. So let me tie this off because I need, and I'm just doing, again, I would do, if I was doing a really fancy piece or doing some silk and embroidery, I would do just the, the lock stitch or the setting stitch instead of knotting, but I'm just gonna knot that off and that and I love 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 these scissors I found them here at the shop the Karen K Buckley scissors I am fanatical about making sure I keep these only for fabric just because they are so good and I have them in a couple different sizes but they are really my favorite fabric scissors so I'm going to move that piece to the side and I've got one here that I've already started and you can see here I wasn't working on the frame there and I, I don't usually work in a hoop or on a frame and a lot of the reason for that is because I work on scraps or small pieces of fabric, or also because I really just don't like to waste fabric. And you know, when you're putting it in a frame, you have to have a lot around the edges. But one of the things that you can do is you can put, it's not quite as good, but you can put your, put another piece of fabric into the frame and then pin your smaller piece in the middle so that it'll still help stretch it. And that just helps keep it from puckering. Some of these, you can tell I didn't use a frame and they've puckered a little bit, which for what I'm gonna use this for, it does not bother me, it's fine. But if you want to have something that would be like display quality, or you're doing it as um, it's gonna integrate into something where having it be smooth is important, I would make sure that I use one of these. But you can see here, I've already, oops. Actually, you know what, <laughs> I wasn't thinking that through. It doesn't really work. I saw somebody do this and I thought that's a great idea, but it doesn't really work because then I'm gonna stitch it to the piece behind it. So, <laughs> ignore that. I thought that's great, I'll try that today. Mm, don't ever do things for the first time on a live video. Just saying. So I'm gonna set that aside, but if you don't mind stitching it to the fabric in the back and then cutting around it, that works. So I am just going to continue here and set a few more. And you can see on this one I did back stitches. And I'm gonna do a split stitch here to show the difference. And of course it takes longer to find the middle when you're doing it live. And I'm just gonna come in here so that you can see the difference in, um, I caught a little something in there, but you can see the difference in how the, um, how the holes show where here you don't really see it, and here you see the very defined up and down point where the needle goes in and out. So that's one of the reasons why I've started to go more toward the split stitch. And then what I'm gonna do to cover up the frame is just switch to a satin stitch. And the thing that I like about using the stamps is that once you've stamped it, you can think of it as more of a, um, a guideline. You don't have to follow everything 
you know, detail for detail. And I'll show you on um, one of these how I've just kind of freestyled a little bit after I stamped it and got, it started, got started, because a lot of my stamps in particular are quite detailed. But I'm just doing the satin stitch, which just wraps around. And I, being somebody who really abhors waste, have tried in the past to say, well, what if I just went stitches next to each other instead of wrapping around on the underside so that I wasn't using double the thread? And I want to show you the difference. So right now I'm doing the satin stitch where I'm just wrapping completely around. And you wanna get in as close as possible to that outline so that you're nice and even. And you can see what that looks like. And I would continue that all the way around. You can see here, I did it to try and save thread and didn't wrap it and just try to set them next to each other. You can see the difference in how neat it looks. Um, and so it really is, worth it to make sure that you're doing going all the way around because it just looks so much nicer and here you can see too because I'm using the variegated thread how that changes color on you and I just like that effect but you know they have the solid colors as well if you don't want that but I love the ability to get that change in color without having to change my needle so just do one more and then I'm going to set this aside let me tie that off really quick because I want to show the flowers and let me get my I have this little leather thimble and then I've stitched it really it's a really ugly stitch but I stitched it to fit perfectly to my finger so that it doesn't fall off when I'm working because I tend to use this particular finger to um, push the butt of the needle through. And so I can be in a lot of pain if I forget to put those on. When I'm really going, I have, um, I have rubber thimbles on this finger and on middle finger and on my thumb so that I'm, you know, because if I'm really doing it for a long time, that gets me so um, it keeps me protected because otherwise I will be very sore by the end. So you can see if you look at, I want to show the actual stamp here. You can see the stamp, so you can see what the flowers actually look like in the design. And this is where I like, you can just put that down as like a, here's a positioning idea for what it is. And then you can just riff on it and do your own thing. You could outline each one of those flowers as they're stamped if you wanted to, but instead I just went with a detached chain stitch or uh, just a lazy daisy and I just said, you know, I can't really see where that flower is. So I'm just gonna come up where the middle is supposed, supposed to be and you come up and you go down and then you come up a little ways out and then you pull through the loop now, if you were doing a, ch a chain stitch, you would, you know, you keep going and make the chain, but the detached chain stitch is where you just do the loop without having it be part of a chain. And then I would just come back and I'll do the whole flower so that you can see how that, that thread changes as you're going and just creates, oops. If I don't prick myself at least five times, it's not a sewing session. And if I haven't drawn blood, then I just count my lucky stars. I was taking a, um, a Kantha workshop in Jaipur in India, and the poor workers who were in there just kept coming, no, 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 if you keep sewing that way, you're gonna prick your finger. And I said, well, that must be why I prick my fingers all the time. But I could not for the life of me figure out what they were trying to show me about holding the fabric so that I didn't do that. So I just figure that's par for the course. Maybe somebody can help me. <laughs> Gwen, there's a couple questions. Okay, shoot. Um, what size needle do you use? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> there, so there's a needle book by Liz Kettle um, on using the right needles, and I have bought it, and I have not read it yet. Um, I use whatever needle has the smallest eye possible to get my thread through it. Um, and then I am using an embroidery needle or a cruel, uh, well, for this, I'm not using cruel needles. Those are for the wool threads. But um, I'm trying to learn better about which needles you use for what. Um, but this is an embroidery needle, and then it is, um, it is just 
whatever eye I can get that thread through. And because the bigger the eye, the bigger the hole that you're gonna put in your fabric. And so you want that to be as minimal as possible so that it is as close as possible to the size of the fabric that, or the thread that you're putting through. Does that help? And the other okay. question is about your gloves. Yes. And um, what brand are they? I, I know we don't carry them, but do you, where did you get I them? I bought these on Amazon and these are a copper glove and they may actually be, I don't know if the symbol helps anybody to locate them. Um, they may be copper brand because they have the copper lining in them. The, I have another pair at home and you just look up arthritis gloves um, and they were fairly cheap. They were about $8 and I wear those sometimes because the fingers come up above my, my middle joint here. So if I'm feeling like today I've got a pretty inflamed joint on this finger. So if they're feeling really tight, then I'll wear the ones that come up higher. Um, and those, um, those are very helpful. And it really does help with the fatigue in your hands to wear gloves. Um, it's, it's nice to have that compression and help keep the blood flowing, which is also good for helping with um, avoiding carpal tunnel, which I'm really worried about. So any other questions? Are we... And someone asked about stranding and your, the, the pearl cotton you're using is not okay. stranded. No, it's not stranded. Um, when I'm doing, it really depends on what I'm working on. If I'm using a stranded floss, I usually don't just because I, I can't be bothered with pulling them out of, you know, having to card them or pull them out of a skein. I do usually split them um, maybe two or three strands if I'm doing like a foundation stitch. So, um, but yeah, I like to use these Eleganza threads because they're not stranded. And then you just buy the size, like this number eight is a nice size. And then they have different sizes. You have the very thick with the five or there's a, um, a th the, I'm sorry, the three is the really thick one. And then there's the five, which is kind of a medium. And then this is the thinner one, which is nice. So good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is getting the satin stitch around that outline, the foundation outline, because you can outline again later. And then doing that detached chain or the lazy daisy to make the flowers. And then I've already stitched out the leaves, but the leaves are really just, you can do a back stitch or a split stitch, which is really, you know, it's just a running stitch and then you come back up and cover over the spots that you've missed. And so those are fairly easy and I just used the Eleganza for that. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, all right, so I'm going to move over to this one where I have completed. And once again, I've got, so you can see where I did satin stitch the way that you're supposed to do satin stitch, satin stitch trying to save thread and looking like crap. So that, <laughs> that is the difference there so that you can see it and then completing all of the, the flowers. So what I want to do now is switch over to beading. And you can see, I love to do, I love to add beads to things and I will get, this is fairly minimal as far as beads go. I've put beads in the middle of the flowers and then I've done, and I'm gonna show you, I did kind of a poor job here. I'm still mastering the art of couching, but I will show you that. And then I just did a little scattering of beads here, but you can see on some of these, I've gone very, very um, almost encrusted. This would be something that would work more as a jewelry piece or, and you can really see that it's very, very heavy on the beads. And so I like both looks. Uh, and, but for this one, I'm gonna kind of go, I'm gonna show, I'll just do a couple of beads in the middle and then do just a line and show you the couching. So I will talk first about the supplies that I use for beads. And this is just a bead tray that I've got for travel. But the beads that I'm using are from the bead mixes they have here in the shop. And you can see I'm really, really low on my aqua mix. I need to grab some more. But I've pulled out the size and color that I want. And I pulled out some white ones from here. But they've got all colors of bead mixes and they have a ton of different kinds of beads in there and I use them all the time. And so I've got just a beading needle. And mine, I use it so much, and it's bent. I've used it so much, but you can get beading needles in all sizes and this is quite a thin one and you can see, you can almost not see because it's so thin how tiny that hole is because I'm gonna be using these little teeny tiny size 11 seed beads. And so I want to make sure that this will fit through when it's threaded. And I'm using a beading thread. This is one that I learned about here at the store that I've really come to love. It's called Silamide. 
and I get it on these giant spools and it comes in several colors. I'm using this kind of a gray just because it's so neutral that it really will work with everything and I don't need to change the color of my thread. But I've got that already beaded or, or, or threaded because I'm not threading needles on <laughs> Facebook Live. That's just a recipe for disaster. But I'm going to just come up right here in the middle and I've got a little fuzzy. Come up right here in the middle and then I just pick up a bead and I've got this felt here. Um, when I'm at home, I usually put the beads on the felt and I'll put, let me put a little smattering of these guys on there because I'll show you just how much easier it is to pick it up. Just a piece of felt works great. But I'm gonna put, and then just go back down where I came out and pull it. And then a lot of times if I'm doing just a single bead, I come back up again, but you don't have to. This is me being over and then I double through and usually pull the fabric with me on a regular basis. So that's all part of the fact that I am really not an expert at this. Now, the thing when you're doing beading in particular, you want to be careful about not traveling with the thread. So I will come up next to this and I'll set another one and I just pick them up and then go back down. And I'm, I'm careful about not traveling with the thread in the back. And what I mean by that, because that's, an, uh, that's how things get, um, they get ripped off or they get tangled. And hold on while I go ahead and set this one. But if I was going to come on the back and say I wanted to put a bead over here, I am not going to then come up like this and go across that because your thread is traveling across here and you're going to have this big thing that can get caught if you do that. So usually if I'm going to go a far distance, you know, I'm done beading here, I'm ready to go up here, I will knot it off and start over again. If I'm gonna just go, okay, I'm done here, but I wanna go over here, what I do is I come on the back and I go underneath the stitches that are there, and then I will pop back up in the middle so that that thread is contained and it's not gonna get ripped. And it's just, it's just a way to keep it from catching on things and um, having your work unravel because when you're beading, that is really, you know, once you've done that, you really don't want things coming undone because that's, you know, it can be a lot of work. And the beading in particular is where these gloves are very helpful. So I am going to come right, let me, let me see where's a good so place for me. What do you this. mean when you say set the bead? When I, when I say set the bead, I just mean stitch it and lock it down into place. And so I'm going to come over and I'm gonna do one more just so that I can get my thread in position here to show you the lines and the couching. And I will just caveat, I am still learning to be good at couching. Um, and I'll show you what couching is here in just a second. Um, and it's a, it's a technique that you can do with beads, but you can also, it's also done in gold work um, where you're doing thick, gold threads and cords and things, and then you put them in place and then you use a couching stitch to lock them down to the fabric. So now I'm in place right here. I'm gonna bring, what I wanna put that beaded border on the inside. So where's my little, I set something on top of my sample. This little beaded border right here. So, so I'm going- Someone asked earlier, uh -huh. What, what, why what? you do the satin stitch and then if you're going to couch over it? I'm not going to couch over it. I'm going to couch next to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is just come in here and pick up, oops, a whole bunch of beads. And keeping in mind, I have done this a lot. And of course, because I'm on Facebook Live, I'm not doing as great a job picking them up. When you first start doing this, it, it will be hard to pick them all up. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at this and go, okay, that's too far. I'm gonna take two of them off. 
And the thing with couching that I am still struggling with is you don't want to come all the way, all the way to the edge. I could stick another bead on there, and then what's gonna happen is it's gonna buckle like this. And so when I'm doing these lines, so I get them on and I get them the length that I want them to be, and then go ahead and bring your needle down at the end. And then I'm gonna work back. And I'm gonna bring, and I wanna spread those out a little bit. And then I'm gonna bring my needle up about every two beads, every two or three. And I've come up and I'm gonna wrap around and go down. And you wanna be careful that you go down kind of on the inside so that you don't see the stitch and I pull it down in between the beads, okay? And then I'm gonna come up again, a couple more beads down, wrap around, go down on the inside. And I use my fingernails quite a lot to, um, oops, you have to be careful when you're not paying attention. I would recommend not talking <laughs> while beading if you can avoid it and bring that down and then I'll come up one more time right here and just catch this one on the end and really depending on what it's looking like you can go every two beads every three beads um, it's going to depend on the size of the beads and what you're doing but when you're done you've got a line that's been nicely secured so it's not going to move all over the place but it's a lot easier and cleaner looking than trying to stitch each bead individually and much much faster so then when I'm done, I'll just come over and I will knot that off. Um, I'm particularly careful about making sure that I knot really well when I beat it, just because I don't, you know, you don't want that coming off. Um, and beading thread does come in different weights and you're, you want to make sure that, um, for this I don't need a heavy weight because I'm just using these light seed beads. But if you're gonna do heavier, um, if you're gonna do heavier, bigger beads, you'd wanna use a heavier, bigger thread. And then they have beading needles that have larger eyes and that will work with that. But that is going to give you the beginnings of that little inside border. So you can see now how that works. And then all I've done to do like these little, then I'll just come up and, and randomly I'll grab, oops just jumped right out so it must want to be used this is a size I think this one's a six it's a slightly larger Oops. and I do this that's one of the hazards of not working in a hoop is that you um, you catch your fabric all the time um, and then working on the older fabrics you do get some threads so you just kind of have to be careful because it will unravel a little bit when I'm doing them individually like this the same as with the flowers I do double knot them because I find that it helps them to stand up a little bit better so that you're not seeing the sides of the beads, you're seeing the top of it. And then I'll come over just a little bit. And, and doing this kind of work is where traveling really can come into play. So you wanna be careful about making sure that you're not, um, you're not going too far with your thread on the back of the fabric without either going something else or, then, or knotting it off and then starting fresh. So. So I'm going to go ahead and, oops, I'm coming in too, too far away. That's going to look terrible. You do want to make sure you come in as close to, as possible to the edge of the bead so that you don't see that thread. And then I'm going to go ahead and just tie that off on the back. Oop. And ooh, catching everything while we're doing it live here. So I'll just tie that off. And so that is basically all of the techniques that I used for this part. Now, what you can see on some of these that I didn't do on here, but I'll show it to you, is I've added gold. And another step that you can do that you see this, especially in silk embroidery or cruel, is that they'll do some outlining and surface stitches. And so let me put, where did I put the lid for this guy? get this out of the way otherwise beads will be everywhere you just know it's going to happen okay 
So I love to use a little bit of metallic thread and you can outline some elements here. I've just added some accent stitches here and there. Here I've done full on outlines. You can see I've used much larger beads on the tip. I've just done outlined with a little running stitch around the outside. So there are a lot of options for how you can embellish it so that it, you know, depending on what you're feeling, what the design feels like it calls for. In this one, whoops, I've taken, I've taken just a gold thread. There are a lot of great gold threads on the market. I do find that I don't usually use a needle threader, but metallic threads are one place where I almost always use one. They just tend to split really bad. This one will break into strands. Um, I almost always use just the full because it's so thin and sometimes I will double it in the needle and then tie it off. But I'll just come in and I will outline like I've done here and I outlined with a split stitch just all the way around it. And on this, you can see it's thicker. That's because I doubled it. So I pulled it all the way through and then knotted so that I had doubled the strands. And on the inside, you can see I used a single strand and that just makes it a lot thinner. One same thing on that one. And I would just come up and I'll come along the edge of one of the lines, something that I want to highlight. And here I'm gonna use that split stitch again, which is a, a good um, outlining stitch as well. And let's see if I'm not doing a very good job here, but I wanna get that so you can get a, a sense of what it looks like. And it's just a fun, I, because metallics are very much part of my style, it's a fun way to add a little bit of my personal touch and the way that I, you know, that it, it really makes it look like me, even though it's stitching as opposed to, um, you know, another form of artwork, which is what you normally see me do. So the question is, uh -huh. what do you do with your finished projects? So that is a very good question. That is where I'm gonna stop on the gold. And then I'm gonna go ahead and segue into, um, let me just tie that off really fast because I am constitutionally incapable of leaving an unknotted thread and then cutting it off. <laughs> it is not gonna happen. So here I have brought some of my art journals and I want to show so here's an example, and this actually, for anybody who is in the Ornaments and Amulets class, this is one of the pieces I made as a demo in that class, and then instead of making it in something that hang, I put it on the front of a journal, so it's just as an idea. Um, but here, this is a brand new journal, so I've done almost nothing in it. I have a piece, this, this was based off of one of my stencils instead of one of my stamps, exact same concept, just on a larger scale, um, also done on some fabric from an inspiration pack with the wonderful threads. Uh, very similar, but you can see I just stitched it onto a page in my book. And one idea for that, and I'm going to, this is a journal that I've been using a little bit longer, and I wanted to flip, I have a page here in the back with some beautiful Japanese fabric from here on in the shop that I have just added, um, and I was wanting to, and I was thinking I was gonna put one of these like right here or something. And so what I would do is just stitch that into the book the same way that I stitched there. I might cut around it and have it be a little bit closer and then put it here and then stitch it in. So I would do that. You could add them into um, a larger piece. So I've got, um, a, you know, I've got a textile piece up here that I did several years ago that I beaded some stencil designs. No embroidery, I just beaded them. But you could add it, you know, you could add something in place of this card that's there. You could put a piece in there. Or I will work them into pieces like this. Um, this doesn't have any of my embroidery in it, but it's got some embroidered bits in it that are stitched in. And so that's the type of thing that I will do mixed media wise. But um, before I go into the next part, are there any other questions about the actual stitching part of the demo? Because I'm gonna talk about one more way that I use these, but it goes into a new topic, okay? So 
that brings up, we, um, when we announced this, we talked about that I was gonna preview my new, uh, my next class with artistic artifacts, which is on the 24th of this month and it's called Make a Statement. And this is one of the samples, but um, I will show the other ones first, but the, it's a class where we're going to make statement jewelry, but it can also be other things because I know not everybody wants to make jewelry. But I've used one of these little things that, that I made from a stamp. So that's one of my stamp designs from, I'll show you. And it doesn't have to be, but just as an option, you can see that I've beaded these little stamps here. Um, you can use something pre-made, you can use something entirely different in the class itself. But as an idea of how I use things like this, this is kind of um, a little medicine pouch, amulet pouch type of necklace. And this is one of the projects, it could be paper, you could make it out of paper and have it be something you put in a book. And it doesn't have to be something you wear, but this is one of the projects and it's an idea for how I incorporated one of these little pieces that I made. And that has a little thing. And this is made from, I, it looks like I've put a lot of work into this. This is Kantha fabric that I bought here at the shop that comes with the stitching already in it. And so it's really not, um, it's not as involved. You don't have to do quilting. You could just glue your pieces on when we get into class if you want. But the um, I'll provide patterns, and this is one of the projects, and we will make kind of a medicine bag amulet pouch that you could wear. You can put it in a book. You can put it on clothes. You could do whatever you want with it. And then I've, I've put some closures on it, some little hook and eye closures, because I just thought it looked better that way. Whoops, it helps if you put your... Maybe I shouldn't have taken my glasses off so soon. Um, but that is one project. And then another one of the ones is this one that I'm wearing. And I am gonna show how to make this kind of a centerpiece. And um, I've made this pretty much from scratch, except for the, the substrate, I didn't make that. Um, but I've made that and I will show the techniques for doing it. And then also these beads. And let me show you, I have another one so you can see it without trying to zoom in on me. Just a different option for the center, but we will make these beads. I call them kind of like their fabric, like an obi bead, because the inspiration was the way that they wrap the obis on the kimonos. But there are statements built into each of these pieces in multiple ways. And so the idea is it's a statement piece that you can wear if you choose to make it jewelry, but you'll build a statement into it in different ways. Like literally we'll put statements inside of these and then also the idea is that you're making a statement in the supplies that you're using and talking about using things that are meaningful to you and tell your story and are a part of your personal style. So that is another one of the projects. And then the third project for this class is a little frame. And again, you will not need to make them exactly like I did. You're, it's very, very open to interpretation. I make all of my classes so that you can really customize it based on your style and what you want it to be. So this is also very obviously something that could go on the front of a journal. Um, I've made it as a necklace and you could put a piece of artwork in here or a photo or an image transfer or anything like that. And obviously use whatever embellishments you want, whatever kinds of chains or things you can attach. That's not necessarily part of the class. I will show how I put some of them together, but for the most part, that would be up to you. And I'll show how I've made some of the little embellishments and things, but those are the samples and there will be more information, photos and everything coming um, probably within the next week, I would say. But Somebody is, suggested those trade beads, those African trade oh, beads would be perfect. Are here. I know, I, I bought more than a few. Um, there aren't actually, there are a few in here, like some of these little glass ones. Um, there are actually more of them in this necklace that I'm wearing. There's a little one on the bottom one here, um, this is a brass um, donut bead or a, a dough gun trade bead. And then there's another one here and some in the chain. There are a little bits of trade beads in those too. And that's a fantastic way to use them. And they're, they're kind of pricey, so I'm like, I can't use a lot of them in one, but they really make an impact. And so it is really a great place to use the trade beads as well. Um, and I like those because they tell a story and they, you know, they kind of make their own statement too. So. Um, that is probably a little longer than I intended to go today, <laughs> but
but that's the stitching with stamps. So hopefully that was interesting. Maybe you learned some new things or some new techniques or just got a little inspiration. And then just a preview of the class that will be coming later this month. So that's all I've got. So any other questions or anything? Otherwise, we'll... wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, okay. Oh, Gwen's request. Oh, yes. So I made a request that they create these little scrap bundles of smaller bits of these trims that they get in from India so that you're not having to buy full yards. And I am super excited about this. This is brand new, I haven't seen these before. And these would be really fun for creating some of the beads or things, or just using to embellish your yes. textile art. And, and they, we have restocked. Yay, they restocked. These journals, are made from silk saris that are also coming from India. And I have to open one of these because the paper inside of them, I'm such a paper fiend. The paper, I don't know if you can get a look at the texture, but this cotton rag is just so beautiful to work on, to draw, to collage on for watercolor. These are just really gorgeous journals. And they have these beautiful silk covers that are made from upcycled fabric. And the large ones are, and they have them in different colors. You can choose your color. Um, not that I would know anything about having ordered these journals on the website, but you can see just how, and you get quite a few pages in the book, but they're just beautiful. And they're handmade, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they're just gorgeous books, and the paper is so fantastic. I'm such a huge fan of cotton rag paper. So these, and then they've got the beautiful printed cotton rag papers that come in gorgeous boxes. Um, I actually use some of those. Somebody ask about this piece. I used some of those papers on here. This piece was a sample that I made for this new, oops, I goobered it, for, um, oops, sorry. for my new set, when, my flower stamp set. And it's actually got little bits of fabric wrapped around these little frames that I made. So fabric and trims wrapped around paper. And um, if you go to my website, there is a link in the tutorial section to, um, well, there's an announcement for the new stamps, and if you link over to the Paper Artsy blog, there are a lot more, there are more pictures of it, so you can see some of the close-ups. Um, I think I might have a few more pictures on my, on my blog as well, but it's GwenLaFleur.com, um, so you could go and look, but that's got little bits of fabric and things mixed in there. I love to put fabric into my mixed media work. Um, this is actually a collage that I did for a class we were gonna do in person last year before everything got canceled that we will bring back eventually. Um, it's Japanese fabric from the store, but it's called collaging with fabric. So I love to build fabric into my collages and you can see just the beads and everything mixed into a mixed media without doing any stitching. So there are options to do that too. So any other questions or no? All right, I think we're good, we'll wrap it. So thank you everybody for coming. Very exciting, a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed it.